Um, just to try to just do this one. Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to thank uh, the CSR Mineral Resources for giving me this opportunity to present my work to you. Uh, I also would like to uh, thank our sponsors uh, for this work, uh, Gold Road Resources and uh, Duke Mining. Special thanks for uh, uh, Clayton Davis and um, uh, John Donaldson Rickberg from Gold Road and uh, Chris Dikova from Duke Mining for their help during this, this study. As you see the title here, Mineral Explosion Area of uh, Cover, I just removed the word deep, the word deep from the, from the title for one reason, because the word deep is a relative word. It depends on everyone how he think about the word deep. So if you think about deep cover is up to 50 meters, then that's deep. If it's more than that, then. So I will leave this debate until you see the presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, when you see um, Australia uh, here, Australia, as you see here, is mostly uh, dominated by Phenolozoic cover in a red color, as you see here in the map. And in some places, you have the Eastern Australian field, which is more typical Cambrian. Uh, in rock, we have also uh, Proterozoic basins in part of Australia, but almost <clears throat> 75 of the uh, percent of Australia is covered by, by Phenolozoic uh, rock. When you see the surface of Australia here, as you see here, is mostly uh, almost flat in some places and covered by vegetation and some colluvium and looming in the surface. And uh, we normally use the surface technique like soil and vegetation thermite mount to look for uh, any uh, anomaly on the surface. But when this study, we try to um, go under the surface to see what's going on um, beneath the surface. So we mostly will focus in this presentation on the transported cover, as you see here from one of the mine pit. Um, but why we would like to go down um, below the surface? As I mentioned before, um, the, most of the work done uh, at the moment on uh, area of shallow cover, where the vegetation and termite mounds and bidogenic carbonate and fine soil fraction have been successful in locating the mineralization under shallow cover, mostly between two to 20 meters in certain environment that, that this is all. But actually, when you see the surface, there's a number of places where you find floodings or it, that erode any surface anomaly, and also dilution by sandy dune in some places. So that may give the um, or make the surface technique not working in some places, as I mentioned before. However, when um, deep drilling to go down to get high density sampling in large area for the basement beneath the anchor point is very costly. So we need to think efficiently to get the benefit of the cover itself. So, because we found, we still found that the cover itself can provide opportunity for exploration. Um, here, an example for an example from Mount Isa, where we test the the termite mount, for example, and. One of these example was an anthill uh, prospect, one of the recently discovered copper deposits in the western fold belt of Mount Isa. And this is uh, the surface map of this deposit, which is present in this um, circle. Um, we tested a soil profile and also get sample from the termite mounds. And we actually found very good and nice multi-anomaly uh, over the mineralization using the termite mount, especially in the bismuth and indium and, uh, and, and, and gold as well. And the result of this study in details, you will find in Salama et al. 2016 uh, in the Journal of Geochemical Exploration. So that's almost have been selected uh, because this is a truncated landscape where we find the soil uh, in the truncated part of the landscape is mostly calcareous soils but there's no deep cover in this plane. And also on this dissected plateau here, we will find ferruginous soil, but there's no thick cover in this area. So the termite mount will work perfectly. Another example done by Rabia and et al. Uh, in uh, Mula well, where the termite also give a response in area of less than five meter of cover. Why are we looking for the transported cover? Because transported cover, as you see from this diagram, is actually obscuring, masking a number of deposits, as you see here from this diagram. 
And this deposit is actually uh, present under transported cover of different uh, sedimentary material, different age. So we have transported cover, mostly tertiary palliate channel, a number of these deposits either under, under the main axis of the palliate channel or at the, the, the shelves or the edge of this palliate channel. And you, here, you have a number of, or example of this deposit, for example, on the shelf of the Pali channel, you found a molar well, Mount Gibson, Bullshine, Callistal, Brown's Wing, and Lothers of this example. That deposit is under the shelf of the Pali channel. On the main axis of the Pali channel, you have Rose Diamond Garden Well, for example, in the Duke and Goldstone Belt. One of the recently discovered world class deposits in the Yamana terrain is actually on the edge of the Pali channel as well. An area of the Permian cover. For example, where we have Permian dynamic type, we have a Redeemer and Lansfield South is also under Permian dynamic type deposits. On the edge of the value, uh, in the edge of the yield garden creating, for example, we have a number of deposits and prospects that's actually under uh, different types of Permian sediments and the Eulian sand. So all of these examples show how the cover can obscure um, good deposits itself. It is important to understand the topic of the, present, uh, the presentation today and also to give you a, a bit of information about the mechanism of metal dispersion. First of all, when we have the host rock or the bedrock hosting mineralization, these bedrock have been subjected to deep weathering and forming residual weathering profile. And the metal can move through this deep weathering profile by a variety of um, dispersion mechanisms discussed in detail in Anandi et al. 2016 in our review. This is a combination, one of these or combination of this method can work together, including the biotic and gaseous or electrochemical transport. But once we know that, the, inter the, the, the unconformity between this residual material and the overlaying transported uh, cover the interaction between any residual material in the in the residual or any element in the residual uh, weathering profile and the overlaying first unit of the cover, this interaction between these two units will move the metal from that enriched in the residual material up to the first unit of the cover. And once you started to put the next layer and next layer, the interaction between each unit with the overlaying one will bring the anomaly upward by one of these mechanisms. But the most important factor here is the groundwater oscillation through the cover itself. So we have period where the water table where, uh, was where, uh, close to the surface during the humid period, and during the added condition, it goes down. And when the water table is moving up, it, the, the, the redox reaction going through, through the cover itself. And this is the location of the redox front or the value water table level within this cover. And these places is actually anomalous zoned within the cover itself. Once the, the groundwater coming down, this value water table or redox front remain in the cover itself, leading to, to the underlying mineralization. And when the water table come close to the surface, the pedogenic process on the surface, like vegetation and bioturbation and termite, can move any anomaly from this value redox front upward to the, the surface. If you would like to read more about this, as I mentioned, you can go for Anand et al. 2016 to know more about the dispersion mechanism. Here, the topic of the, present, the presentation is actually sedimentary interface. If you look for this uh, diagram, for example, here, this is an example where we have the Permian cover in many places of um, WA, um, Yelgon Clayton, and uh, Albany Fraser, Pattinson Province. And in some places, you will find the value channel on tertiary. Um, tertiary age. And this is covered by this quaternary colluvium alluvium or uh, Eulian sand in some places. The idea of the interface is actually we divide the interfaces here into three types. The first type is called the physical interface, which is equal, uh, actually equivalent to the unconformity. So when we talk about unconformity, especially those major unconformities, the one between the main cover and the underlying saprolite or fresh rock, that one major unconformity, and between the tertiary and the and 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 the permian, the another unconformity, and between the uh, the tertiary and the overlaying, certainly another unconformity. All of these are physical interfaces or unconformity. 
Along with this unconformity, you can exhibit mechanical dispersion of any residual weathering or sedimentary component. If you think about the Permian uh, unconformity here, that can, along which above it, component of the residual uh, mineralization can move down the slope, forming transported interface anomalies. And also in the base of the valley channel, you can get some material coming from the residual terrain down along the valley channel itself. But we are not looking for the interfaces uh, as just only dispersion. Some of these interfaces also, or the cover itself, can also contain some economic deposit. For example, we have two examples here I will show you. One is supergene deposits mined from the secondary uh, deposit along the edge of the valley channel at Muller Well. And another one is at the base of the valley channel at Garden Well. So those types of the deposits are economically uh, mined. And also a third type, which is actually alluvial gold deposits near the Kambalda, all of these alluvial or value placer also can be mined at the base of this value channel. If you look on the location of this deposit, it's actually about these interfaces. Not only this interface, physical interface, but we have also chemical interface, where we expect the groundwater to move the element through the cover up to the surface represented by value redox of France. So this is formed by hydromorphic dispersion of metals by groundwater percolating through the cover after the uh, deposition. We have also some of uh, mixed or different type of uh, interface called physical chemical. So the material can move mechanically, but later on can be enriched by hydromorphic dispersion. These interfaces are generic and abundant and can be sampled very easy. Here an example for the chemical interface within the cover. So you can see here uh, the, this uh, chemical interface. And here, for example, the interface between the value channel clays, for example, this material, you can see the difference in color between the value channel clay and the underlying saproli. And if you don't know, this is very tricky to pick up this interface because the clay, are, the interface is separating between the saprolytic clays, residual saprolytic clays, and the value channel clays. Another interface between the Permian and the underlying fresh rock, you can see here the Permian material is scouring, Permian glacial material is scouring the underlying fresh rock in Northeast Yilgan. That's physical unconformity. To determine the unconformity sometimes, especially in the value channel, we can use the hyperspectral analysis, especially the Korean crystallinity, to show the difference between these two different materials. So, well crystalline is uh, clay is characteristic of the residual saproli compared to the poorly crystalline clay uh, characteristic of the pali channel, uh, pali channel uh, of clay. That's through the hyperspectral analysis. Not only we focus on, on the interfaces within the cover itself, but we also try to combine the interface with the indicator mineral in the cover. So, from this diagram, when we see this diagram, I have divided this indicator mineral in the cover into four categories. The first one actually is a detrital uh, indicator minerals formed by the physical weathering of the fresh rock. And this is driven, uh, for example, when we have the Permian diamectite, you will see in the next examples that the lower part of the Permian diamectite is fresh. And we assume that this fresh sediment is derived from fresh rocks before the weathering event happened in the post-Permian time. So all of this material here, especially sulfide grains, have been, have been preserved in the lower part of the Permian diamectite. And the groundwater here is marked between the fresh diamectite and the weathered diamectite on the top. These detrital grains can, can weather above um, the water table forming supergene indicator mineral after the detrital indicator minerals. In the residual terrain of the paleo uh, channel um, sediments, in the residual terrain, you have the mineralization, for example, and some of the indicator minerals can be residual in the satellite and concentrated in the overlaying URI class. And this we call residual or inherited indicator mineral. This is resistant to weathering to stay as it is in the weather profile. The last group is the one that diagenetic uh, indicator minerals that form in any organic rich clay in the Permian sediment or in the tertiary sediment, especially those gray clays. Uh, 
Um, this can be, for example, any sort of wind, any, any, any element that highly mobile that can be uh, uh, precipitated in the clay. And also above the water table, this, this indicator mineral are wizards to um, supergene minerals. So all of this mineral can give clue to the underlying mineralization. So here I will show you the first example that I told you before about the example from those dispersion, uh, mechanical dispersion uh, and hydromorphic dispersion at the base of the valley channel. Here we have the example of the garden well um, uh, in the new stone stone belt. This deposit is actually here. And when you see the DM, it's in the middle of the valley channel here. So you can see here this deposit is actually uh, the supergene deposit extended to 400 meter and overlain by 35 meter uh, of uh, valley channel clays extended um, uh, uh, for, the, for, 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 the, for the halo itself in the valley channel, in the base of the valley channel, extend for more than 1500 meters away from um, the, the, the width of the main mineralization, which is almost 400 meters. So it's giving a uh, wide anomaly in the base of the valley channel. You can see more about this in a recent paper by Anand and Salama in 2019 in the Explore newsletter. Here you can see which material that give this type of the unconformity at the base of the pallet channel. Here an example of a similar pallet channel near the Grosser. We see the pallet channel sediments see here, and here is the, the unconformity between the cover and the underlying saprolar. When you come closer to this material, you can see it's mostly ferruginous gravels. Here is the nature of this gravel at garden well. And when you do some microanalytical work on this material, you actually see the supergene gold in these gravels like this. This is a laser ablation ICBMS maps of these gravels. You can see dispersion of the gold and copper and arsenic within this material. And also this part of the Anand and Salama uh, 2019 in uh, Exeblo. So when we move from the main axis of the pallet channel to the edge of the pallet channel, we find another example, which is uh, also in the Newton Green Stone Belt in the Muller Well. Um, this is uh, actually a very good example of those material uh, on, on the edge of the pallet channel, mostly gravels or ferricrete. Uh, and this is actually, you can see it here, this is a supergene uh, deposits uh, in the saprolite. And actually, in the ferrofit material, which is uh, derived from the weathering of the existing rocks, giving a very large uh, anomaly that extends along the flank of the valley channel for several kilometers. Also, again, if you need any more information about this type of deposit, Anand Salama et al. 2019 and Anand et al. in the geology 2017. Um, I just go quickly through these examples because this you can go and read about this example in detail in the publication. Um, but I will give a little bit slow motion when I come to these examples of area uh, covered by sandy dunes and Eulian, sorry, and 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 Permian sediments. Here I just will come to show you where is the area of the Permian sediment and the Eulian sandy dunes. Actually, when you look on the edge. Of the valley of the of the Western Australian Shield in the northeast of Albany Fraser, uh, around Tropicana, and also part of the Fraser Range in the Albany Fraser, and also in the eastern part of the Marna, so east part of the Elgin Crater, particularly in the Marna terrain. And the extension to the Patterson Province, you will see that the surface is covered by a sandy dune, longitudinal sandy dune, mostly running north, uh, with southeast. And in the north uh, east Albany Fraser near Tropicana, also a lot of sandy dunes um, with a vegetation cover. So almost the landscapes and vegetation and the regulus is almost similar. I will show you some examples here. Uh, I will focus in the next few slides on the Amarna terrain, the work that we did with the gold road in the Amarna terrain. Here you will see the Amarna terrain is actually, when you see it here, it's um, the most true easternmost uh, uh, greenstone belt is Dorosi Hill greenstone belt and also the um, the Amarna uh, greenstone belt. And most of the Amarna terrain of the Hillgun craters is actually under under cover, especially this Permian and the Julian sand. When you see the surface again in Amarna, quite similar to what we saw in uh, Patterson and also in the uh, in the Albany Fraser longitudinal dunes, and this dune is um, stable by vegetation. Some outcrops, 
of the Permian uh, sandstone over Saprovide. And in this map, you will see that this is the line of the Permian extension within the Yellowgun crater and mostly covered by Permian sediment. It's a very important area because recently discovered, highlighted by the recent discovery of the Gray uh, world class deposit in 2013 by Bodro. Looking for the topography in the area and the distribution of the regolith in the area, you will see that this is a dissected landscape. Area mostly covered or dissected plateau and dissected by a number of value valleys. Some of them is very deep. And the surface in the regolith is mostly dominated by sandy dune and uh, sandy plains, which are, uh, are in the uh, yellow color. Some of the calcrete actually form the value drainage have some slope sediment and some uh, exposure mostly uh, around around Roy. but in the southern part of Yamana um, is mostly uh, sand blades. Uh, when you see this um, map here, this is at the part of um, Yamana terrain, which is, then we call it uh, southern Yamana by, by, by uh, Gold Road. Um, we actually did. Uh, with the uh, help of uh, an owner student from Curtin University together with Gold Road and CSIRO. Um, nice job in logging the Permian or the cover uh, along an area of 40 by 60 kilometer uh, in the southern Yamana to understand how the Permian cover looks like in this area. And actually that's one example of four traverses, east west traverses in the southern Yamana. You will see in some places, you will see the Permian, for example, sometimes erode the underlying saprolite, which is in light blue, and the bedrock is in the dark green. All the yellow color here is in Permian cover. So when you see the Permian cover, it's may, uh, in places where uh, uh, uncomfortably overlie uh, saprolite or there's no saprolite and sit directly on a fresh rock. And in, in one area, we find tertiary valley channel cutting through the Permian cover. And on the top of this Permian cover, we have a layer of ferruginous gravels on the top of the, or between the unconformity between the Permian cover and the overlaying sandy dune, which is in red color. So in this area here, we, this, the origin of this uh, ferruginous gravel will come in the next slide. This slide is very, very important for exploration. If you would like to understand this, um, th this material, this slide shows different types of ferruginous class and ferruginous material near surface. So I put it here uh, in this dark spots to show where the location of this material and in which material, uh, in which um, sedimentary package, and also the, uh, how they are different from each other. Number one, if we come to the older material, there is area in the landscape which is value highs. This value high is actually weathered Archean rocks, weathered to saproli, and there's ferruginous dure crust formed on the top of it. This is an example of the ferruginous dure crust formed on weathered crystalline bedrock. This material show erosion, and some of this uh, fragment of this ferruginous dure crust move across unconformity between the Permian and uh, and uh, along the unconformity above the Permian and forming this ferruginous gravel. So these two types are equivalent in terms of the composition. So they are of similar composition. This material after erosion, it might be re-cemented by iron oxide forming ferricrete. So remember that this is duly class and this is duly class. This is residual in origin and this is transported in origin. If you go for the Eulian sand itself, one of the sum of the drill hole, you see it here, the Eulian sand have a very unique type of orthogenic bezolus. That's very unique to find this type of the bezolus. This bezolus is formed actually in place in the Eulian sand. It's mostly rounded, as you see here in, uh, in, in the resin and fragment separated from by sieving from the Eulian sand. The location of it is in the Eulian sand. But the top of the Permian sediment itself is also ferrogenized, giving this type of the nodules. And also subject to erosion, this top of the Permian can be eroded, forming this type of the bezolus. You can imagine here how complex this landscape. 
But the interesting stuff here over this safe cover in this area, which we see here, up to 50 meter maximum in a number of prospects. This material show significant to exaboration, as I will show you in the next examples. Before going to how this material work, I would like to show how we know or how we can differentiate between these different types. Uh, we found that hematite and gotite and gypsite, gypsite and uh, gotite and hematite are characteristic of the ferruginous dewy crust and ferruginous gravel derived from the weathering of the Archean crystalline rocks. Gypsite, we didn't find gypsite in any of autogenic basalises forming in Eulian sand or in, bis in Permian basalises. So gypsite is a characteristic mineral in those Archean uh, or weathered Archean rocks. Within the autogenic basalises in Eulian sand, the iron mineral dominated here is a gotha together with this ferruginous sphere, or sorry, carinite spheres, and angular quartz grain. This is an element map showing aluminium and silicon and iron. But on the reworked Bermian uh, uh, gravels and basalis here, actually you find this, this from mineral mapping showing that this material is reworked. I didn't show example of orthogenic uh, Permian material, but this is reworked Permian material of basalis formed in Eulian uh, in, in Permian sediment and rework it after the Permian deposition. Here you can see different in mineralogy between the gravels and the matrix itself using the XRF mapping, showing a fragment or the trital grains of uh, mica and 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 feldspar, uh, as you wish, as I show you from the potassium map. Here, so this is just only in the matrix, not in the grain. One of the most important things, if we would like to use a near surface material uh, to get a clue for the underlying mineralization, here we test these types of ferruginous material in one of the sum red hole over the mineralization. Just a look on the base, from the base to the top, we got four samples as examples here. Uh, Laterated gravels drive it from the Dury cast from nearby source over that's represented by this. Uh, red bar, sorry, uh, this uh, blue bar. So this blue bar is the chemistry of this laterated gravel or the ferruginous gravel. The red bar here is representing orthogenic basalis formed in Eulian sand. And the green bar is representing the matrix around this basalis in the Eulian sand. And the orange bar is representing material from the overlaying Eulian sand. What we can see here, the red bar here have enrichment in gold, antimony, copper, manganese, and moly, zinc, nickel, chromium, compared to the underlying ferruginous gravels and even the surrounding matrix. You can see the gold is two times higher than uh, the underlying uh, gravels, for example. However, on the other hand, you will see that iron, arsenic, bismuth, indium, lead, silver, and, and tin is higher in the ferruginous gravel. At least you know that there is some mobility from the underlying in gravels and also Dury class in area of Dury class toward the Eulian sand and concentrated in this particular orthogenic basalis in Eulian sand. It's very important to know that. But to look on the next slide, if you see this thumb in the drill hole in Yamana terrain, this is another thumb of drill hole near uh, northeast Albany Fraser area. You can see similarity in this in, in the cover itself, Eulian sand here overlaying ferruginous gravels. This one of the first project that I have done almost eight years ago, which is the first project I wasn't having enough experience to look for those orthogenic basalis in sand, but at least this sum is in, in near Tropicana, is overlaying Permian sediment here, and we're still able to see the top of the Permian material here, also ferruginous basalis as in this, in this uh, image. And you will see in one of the slides, how this material has been used to find um, or can be tested to see it's near uh, Havana and Tropicana. I'll show this example later on. But it is very important to understand exactly what is the nature of the Permian sediment itself. So this is an example uh, of the Permian in Yamana terrain. Here is a saprolite, and the bottom of this Permian sediment is mostly gravelly sandstone. And the upper part of the Permian sediment 
has or has shown um, evidence of groundwater alteration. You can see uh, redox fronts. Uh, you can see some appreciation of the mudstone within the sandstone uh, cavities, and the top of the Permian uh, cover is highly appreciated. Let's give evidence of uh, weathering of this Permian sediment. However, on the top of the Permian sediment, you can see these ferruginous gravels that above the, 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 the Permian cover. From the first uh, point, you can see it might be an evolution of the Permian sediment or part of the Permian sediment itself. But you will see the chemistry will say something different. On the top of that, you came the Quaternary Eulian sand. But it is important to understand where is the unconformity or where the interface is here. And how about if this ferruginous gravel sit directly on a residual uh, residual uh, material? Are it related to the underlying rock or, a diff or drive it from or, or rework it? If you see, for example, this vertical chemical variation, all the Permian cover in the area has been discriminated from the underlying weathered rock by the rubidium zirconium ratio, which has been reduced above the unconformity. It's higher in the bedrock and in the residual profile, but it reduced drastically above the unconformity in the cover. So you can use this ratio to determine the basal unconformity. But the most important ratio here is the European anomaly. If you look on the European anomaly, for example, the European anomaly is mostly characterized, uh, characterized by the mafic rocks, which is a dominant rock in the uh, Yamarna greenstone belt. Um, when you see the European anomaly in the mafic rocks, it's mostly positive value. And this value actually become preserve it in the weathering profile above it. But when we come to the unconformity, we see changes to the negative value in all the Permian cover. Negative value mostly in the favor of a felsic source rocks. So we believe that the Permian cover in this area is derived from, uh, from a distal source, that's possibly from the surrounding granitic rocks. Even if there's other rocks like uh, mafic volcanic plastic or felsic volcanic plastic, it will keep the same, the same ratio. And again, when we come to hit this origin as gravel on the top, the values start to change again to positive value. So we indicate there is another unconformity here, which may indicate that this material is derived from different, possibly another mafic rocks. Um, in other drill hole over the mineralization, we see ferruginous gravels directly on residual weathering profile. When you see it, uh, it's, sorry, it's not a ferruginous gravel, it's actually cemented in some places forming beauty crust. If you're not expert in the regulus, you will see that it's possibly part of the residual weathering profile. But actually, titanium zirconium ratio see something different. We know that the titanium zirconium ratio in mafic rocks is above 60, if you calculate it, and intermediate rocks between 60 until, I think, 12, give mostly to the end design. And below 12 is mostly for the felsic rocks. So when we come to all the residual weathering profile until we found something similar of this material on the top of residual weathering profile, this material coming down to the felsic rock, and we saw that this is different material not related to the underlying rock. But what is the significance of that? Look for this material. This material actually is uh, anomalous in gold and other metals uh, in, 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 um, in, in over some of the deposits but is actually not derived from the same rock, but is enriched after the position. Here I show you an example from um, the uh, Yamana terrain, especially this smoke push prospect. This deposit is almost uh, sub-vertical, hosted in a mafic rocks, dolerite cover by Permian cover and Julian, uh, Julian sediment. Um, this, this cover here, if you, if you see the mineralization itself, the mineralization itself is mostly dominated by gold and the arsenic and sulfur. Mineralogically, for the mineralization itself, it is dominated by uh, arsenobiorite and biorite and beruta. This is coming from the gold road presentation showing, uh, this is a CT scan of one of the core, showing coarse grain gold. Uh, you can see up to one millimeter here. This is yellow spots here, and arsenobiorite in red, and the green is biorite and, and, and beruta. So remember that the mineralization is limited by arsenobiorite, and the most important element is gold and, and, and arsenic. 
So, as we know this, we try to test this uh, type of new surface material over the Permian cover and uh, actually got the soil samples over this type of deposit here. 70 samples running east-west in a number of traverses. And from the soil sample, uh, we've got the bulk soil sample. Sometimes we get the bulk soil sample like this. We can get the fine fraction and the coarse fraction. The coarse fraction for us is a bezoolus, more than 2,000 micron. But some of the soil sample doesn't contain this material. So we drilled, um, uh, by the help of the gold road, shallow depths up to six meters using the AC drill rigs and some of those sample to got this material. And once we got this material, we started to analyze the fine fraction represented by less than 75 and this bezoolus. What we got, we got that. We got the gold in the bezoolus and gold in the fine fraction. What we saw, we saw very nice anomaly over the mineralization using the bezoolus and also using the fine fraction. However, Look for the constant. And now I can see I'll just keep 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 doing. Um, um the, the gold itself are uh, here is a very high in concentration in the business, uh, the maximum value up to 135 BB uh, P, but in the soil itself is uh, up to 90. So given the, the pre-preparation or the sieving of this coarse fraction, so it's better to use in this, uh, in this example, the coarse fraction like the bezoolus, which will give very good anomaly over the mineralization here. And here, one of the east-west profiles showing very nice anomaly over the mineralization using the soil and using the bezoolus by different types of uh, analysis, strong aquaregia and a mild aquaregia for the fine fraction and strong aquaregia for the um, visualist. Arsenic as well is also giving very nice anomaly over the mineralization, but there's no other element or pathfinder element has shown any anomaly. And when you see the arsenic and the gold, that, these are the main element in the mineralization itself. Remember that we targeted those visualists and gravel under the Eulian sand. When you see um, the anomaly itself, we also find the goal by laser ablation ICBMS mapping of this bezoolus in Eulian sand. Arsenic is also higher in those bezoolus, and gold is occur in a fine fractions or in some of those uh, microcrystalline gold grains. In some other spots on the top of the Permian as well, ferruginous material, the orthogenic part, also we can see the gold is also in the top of the Permian. Uh, stuff in other prospects in, in the next presentation. So laser ablation can also highlight the concentration of the gold and arsenic within this material in addition to the chemical analysis. But it is important to, to see how the gold looks like or concentrate. It looks like microcrystalline nuggets or microcrystalline grains in, in, in this material. Uh, once we see this gold and arsenic near surface, we actually started to do a partial extraction uh, analysis on those materials. So we got material from the soil and material from the business itself, and we ran six types of partial extraction. We found interesting stuff regarding the gold. We found most of the gold in extracted was extracted by potassium iodide and potassium cyanide. These two types of extraction give indication that the gold moved through this material at a soluble or particulate form. Very little was in the extracted by hydrosamine hydrochloride 0 0.1 or 0 0.25, which is actually in, associated with iron and manganese oxide. So remember that part of this uh, gold in the soil and business is associated with manganese oxide. Part also is associated with or extracted by tetrasodium biophosphate, indicating that part of the gold is associated with organic material in, in the soil and the business. Very little with distilled water, indicating there is little water soluble gold in this, in this material. But the most important thing that most of the arsenic has been extracted by tet tetrasodium uh, biophosphate, indicating most of the arsenic moving with organic material. That's the main reason that make us think about the vegetation. If the vegetation played any role, so we tested two lines of the vegetation along with the mineralization and surprise 
we found very nice and coherent anomaly in the vegetation over the mineralization. So that's indicated that the arsenic has been moving efficiently and with the biogenic role, with organic matter as well, and go through the vegetation. We tested here the eucalyptus foliage um, uh, from the eucalyptus trees along these two lines, and both of them giving very nice. Gold wasn't, wasn't good enough, with only one or two spots, but a coherent anomaly in arsenic highlight this type of the mineral Interesting stuff, when we cut this basilis in Eulian sand, we found a lot of microbes, filamentous microbes, and these rounded grains within the basilis forming in Eulian sand. The interesting stuff here that when we hit these microbes by EDX, we found only these microbes can absorb manganese and cobalt in, in this in this bezoes. But the surrounding matrix with the iron oxide matrix is actually polycrystalline and doesn't contain any manganese. So the question that we are trying to uh, follow after this, have the manganese have and the, and the bacteria has got ED gold in it? And what is the actual role of these microbes in the basilis in the metal mobility? But you can see there is organic role and vegetation also role in enhancing and highlighting the anomaly, even if um, the gold is not there, but arsenic anomaly can also be a good indicator for the underlying gold. Another uh, prospect here we did called Tobin Hill, south of Smokebush. Very interesting to see similar, we did we did the same, the same process. Soil samples, basilis, less than 75, and test all of those. But remember, on the value topographic map of the DM, this mineralization extends along the slope. So the first two lines here, we, I'll just give you an example now what we see in this line. This is, this is the line that I show you here. This is very small mineralization, not big one, but I'll show you how it's reflected in the Permian cover. Here we're talking about up to 40 meter Permian cover, and this is cross section along the mineralization here. And this is cross section uh, showing the mineralization and the overlaying. Anomaly. Above the mineralization here, you can see that the gold concentration is increasing in the Permian cover up to the surface, reaching up to 100 dBb gold near surface. Remember that this is the mineralization and this is up to 40 meter uh, uh, thick cover. And the uppermost part of the, of the permit is mottled and this show high enrichment of gold over the mineralization up to the surface here. So we started to analyze the surface material, getting the soil and, and, and also the, uh, the gravels and do the same, uh, the same technique. Here, there is no basilis formed in Eulian sand, so the target here is the top of the Permian itself. When you see, for example, the result of this, it was amazing for us and also a little bit confusing because here we saw only gold anomaly. There is no arsenic anomaly at all, either in the basilis or in the soil. That gives us why we didn't see the arsenic like smoke bush. And we have, and this is a material from the top of the Permian, by the way, that has been analyzed to get this nice uh, shape and the soil above it. We asked you to analyze the, the mineralization in a smoke bush and Tobin Hill and the Serve Prospect in this study, Santana. And the surprise, we find that the primary gold deposit in the Topping Hill is arsenic core because there is no arsenobarite in the mineralization. So that's give us confidence in this material that it will reflect the underlying mineralization if it contain, um, if it contain uh, arsenic or not. The most important thing when you see something like this in the cover, um, this gold anomaly is residual orthogenic, as I, as I mentioned, on top of the Permian cover. Soil anomaly here with pure gold, uh, supergene gold formed in soil. Some explorer may think it could be coming from different ways, especially from uh, transported from somewhere because there's no, no pathfinder element associated with it. But actually, it could be residual and highlighting something underlying in, in, in under the cover. Um, using the top of the pyramid, again, back to the Tropicana here, because there's a similarity here with the Tropicana. And the work done uh, in Anand and uh, Salama 
2019, Mexico Blue showed these two uh, profiles over Havana and Tropicana. So this is an example from the Havana itself, showing that this ferricrete or basolitic ferricrete sampling show very good anomaly just down the slope. Remember, the, this Havana, for example, uh, has been weathered and the material has been just moved slightly uh, away from it to the north and giving this very good anomaly very close to the surface uh, or the surface from uh, from the Havana. Um, this is we worked a pericrete formed uh, in the Permian and then reworked it after Permian. If you compare this type of anomaly over Havana with a third prospect in, uh, in, in southern Yamana, it's called Santana uh, prospect. There is something different from the two stories uh, in Smoke Bush and also in Poppin Hill. This is a, a truncated landscape in Santana. This is uh, the, the prospect location. And we done cross section from the prospect further down to see what's going on, and this is the cross section. What we found here: Permian cover overlain by Eulian sand, which actually in this truncated area in this valley, but on the on the on the dissected plateau on the top of the plateau, we still have the Permian basalts here. But when we look at the Permian uh, basalts, it is very close to the surface. But actually, this is a type of the Permian basalts that is reworked. And I show you how we know that is reworked, but initially we don't know if it's reworked or residual. But after the monologic of the monology, we found it is it is uh, reworked. And this is the um, the uh, Santana mineralization here. And uh, we did one cross section along this line, and this is a drill hole, and this is a cross section to show the mineralization. We done the same approach, soil and business along these two lines, and here the example of one of the, of the southern line. What we found is we didn't find any gold anomaly in the soil or in the business at all on the surface. However, we found some shifted anomaly along the southern part in this area on the surface, giving this surface anomaly. But the, the most important thing that we notice that along the line, unconformity between the Permian cover and underlying subro line. We found an in, uh, increase in the gold above the unconformity just to the uh, west of the deposit. And when you see the unconformity between the cover, it's slightly sloping to the west. So that's very important to know that there is also interface anomaly at the base of the cover to the west of the mineralization. You, you can notice that and you can dis use this as a vector toward the mineralization if you understand the, 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 the topography itself. Just to summarize this, uh, for, uh, to summarize this, um, here what we thought, the really stone belt overlain by a uh, Permian uh, cover and uh, tertiary material. Um, we believe that area of residual value high has been weathered and anomalous in gold, shed some uh, fragment on the top of the Permian. Permian itself is also weathered and gold can move through the cover, forming this physolis on the top of the Permian then the rework it for uh, transported um, gold anomalies. In some places, we see material that derived it from other sources on the top of the deposit and then re, re, um, uh, or enrich it after the deposition, but it's actually not related to the underlying rock. The position of the Eolian sand on the top of this cover also lay with the underlying rock and material from the Permian cover and gravels and duty crust uh, gold and, and arsenic moving uh, up and concentrated in this business in Indian sand, and also the, the anomaly get uh, uh, concentrated in the in the vegetation and with some uh, contribution from the biogenic uh, or from the microbes as well. And this is an example here where we, in some places we find part of um, the cover or the base of the cover is related to the underlying rock. In some places, close to the Santana where we found this interface anomaly. The European anomaly is just to change it to the, from the positive to the negative one, just slightly above uh, the unconformity, but within the cover, indicating the part of the cover could be just to drive it from the underlaying or from the exposed uh, subroman, mafic subroman, subroman like focus on the mafic rocks. It's very important to understand this European anomaly, for example, in the cover, because you can get information 
if you have got something coming from very distant source like this, for example, or something can, can be derived from the reworking of the surrounding rocks or the weather profile. So here I just give you an example of those one, but this is when you have the Permian cover itself is mostly clays and sand at the edge of the of the uh, Yelgan crater. But if you go inside the Yelgan crater, especially northeast part, around Lansfield North, for example, Leverton, Agnew, the Permian cover are mostly Permian dynamic types, very big bouldery material, and is not sitting on a sapro line. The erosion of the of the of the Permian sediment actually, um, uh, sorry, giving um, is seated on the fresh rock. Here an example of Lansfield, for example, um, where this is a shear zone um, gold hosted in a mafic rocks. Here is the location of the mineralization associated with the shear zones, and this is an example from the Duketon uh, greenstone belt done with the Duketon mining. Number of the hole we logged all of that, and uh, we I'll just show you an example how the cover looks like from east to west, crossing the mineralization. It is very important to understand this example because, as I said, it's just only on the northeast Yelgan and might be in parts of the Patterson province. This example shows something important. You need to understand the value topography of the basement itself, and also the nature of the Permian cover. What we saw here, that the lower part of the cover itself is fresh, unweathered. It is formed under the water table here under reducing an alkaline condition. So it is mostly cemented by carbonates and also dominant of super, uh, of, of um, uh, ramboidal um, diagenetic pyrite. Above the water table, all of this dimectite is weathered to a uh, brownish color, as you see here. Here's a contact of the Permian cover on the top of the mafic rocks, and the basal part of the cover is bouldery, as you see it here, and the top part of the top weather part is mostly sandstone, siltstone with some dime types also weathered. Here, because it's very hard to see the unconformity, for example, here, so especially if, you, if you're looking to see something like that in the cover itself, when you come closer to the unconformity, if you use RC ships, it's very hard to determine this, uh, this, this contact. So what's happening here, um, we use the high, high hyperspectral logging to, to determine this contact, for example. What's happening here, what we saw, the white mica stop at this unconformity. So wherever you have this type of rock shifts, you don't need to do anything than just do a hyperspectral analysis and just to see in this example, the stop of the white mica, for example, here. And that's give us the unconformity. The vertical chemistry of the Permian cover over, over, the, uh, over the mineralization show that the gold is, high, is, is enriched or a uh, higher value at the base of the cover, as you see it here, with some enrichment of the sulfur and uh, calcium uh, and magnesium as a carbonate and the sulfur as a diagenetic and the trital sulfides. Gold mineralization has sulfur, arsenic, cadmium, and copper in the mineralization, but some of the gold in the weathered material may also be associated with manganese. You can see that, and we haven't tested that a lot, but this also might have indication of hydromotor dispersion to recover. One of the concluding, uh, or one of the last parts of the, of the presentation here is to see what we've done in, in, this, in this environment. Actually, we target the lowermost meter of the cover itself and started to target the heavy minerals in this in this in this one. What we have found here, we have found a number of indicator sulfide, fresh sulfides, mostly when you sample the base of the fresh sulfides. Uh, sorry, the, the fresh Permian cover. But when you hit the, the, the basal part where, where the part is weathered directly, you get some secondary minerals. What you see here, hornite. Chalcopyrite, arsenopyrite, pyrite, pentlandite, gersodorphite, cobaltite, perutite, chalcosite, and sphalerite and scheelite. And this is over the location of the gold mineralization. And this is example from the SEM showing a variety of sulfides fresh at the base of the cover. So what we've done, we map the, the mineralization and be sure that we found gold 
Arsino by right, being color and orange showing the um, the um, the chalco by right. And when we see the cover itself, we actually see the base part of the cover have this uh, fresh sulfite, mostly here. For example, uh, those green that I show you in the, in, the, in the figure, an example, for example, of the acido uh, pyrite with a variety of uh, uh, pyrite and, 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 and also some pyrite. So that gives us confidence to go down below the unconformity and do interface sampling, get an uh, example, the mixing the, lo uh, the lower most meter of the cover with the upper most meter of the fresh rock, and actually it was giving us a very good anomaly over the mineralization in the same element uh, uh, concentrated in the heavy minerals. So we found gold, arsenic, zinc, cadmium, cobalt, and nickel over the mineralization. And that gives us confidence that the heavy mineral can work very well in this environment where the sediment of the Permian cover sits directly on a fresh rock. The, the last example here, one, one, one slide, uh, I will not go more on than that. I know that's very late. Um, one of the Agnew example where we have similar uh, example of the Permian cover. And the Permian cover is actually very deeper, deep than uh, Lensfield coming up to 200 meters here with similar cover, fresh and weathered cover on a highly rough topography. And this is a fresh rock on the top of the weathered part of the, of the fresh fresh uh, Permian and Wizard uh, Permian cover. Actually, one of the most important thing where this Permian material moving uh, across different rock, per, uh, Archean rock unit, mostly ultramafic mafic rocks uh, in the southern crossing the uh, Scooty Creek sediment and nice uh, organic gnice on the top. What we found that the heavy mineral showed particular uh, concentration of nickel sulfides over this area. And this nickel sulfide also fresh in the lower part, mostly giving good relation between the monazite, and this is a bentland that in bi uh, bir, uh, and byrite, um, cutting across the monazite, and all, and there's a, num a number of this nickel sulfide grain fresh in the bottom of, of, the, of the Permian cover is not found anywhere along this line. So we have a big question mark about this, what's going on here, if there is any nickel source of this sulfide in the cover. Um, I think uh, I'm not going more than that because I think the time is, uh, is, 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 is not, uh, it's almost one hour. Sorry for, for late, uh, um, for more long presentation. I'm just trying to give an example for, um, uh, for um, the Permian and uh, cover in Yelg and Creighton and Northeast uh, Albany Fraser. But um, um, the most important thing here um, that we have put, um, I'll just move quickly for some of those slides, there's no time for them. Just to come, uh, come closer to, uh, to this slide. Um, I think um, this slide, I just would like to let you know that we are putting at the moment an exhibition of interest um, uh, with Amara uh, uh, International using um, the interface and the indicator mineral in area of deep cover to characterize and detect all deposit footprint. Um, um, and uh, this exhibition of interest at the moment is with Zamara. If you would like to get any information in detail about something similar to this work, please contact Adel Simon uh, from Amara. This is uh, her email or, or me using my email. Um, the project or the proposal is around similar material, mostly um, going to the different places of Australia, um, in different provinces, uh, trying to I uh, studied deep area of cover using regular logging identification interfaces, using a variety of, of drill hole, hyperspectral logging, chemical variations, uh, trying to establish a uh, cover stratigraphy using uh, logging, uh, physical logging, and uh, airborne electromagnetics, try to develop the landscape models as well, using the mineralogy and geochemistry to try to understand the anomaly and the mechanism of metal dispersion uh, in order to finally recommend the best or appropriate sampling media and uh, sample spacing in the cover. So if you are interested in, in something like that at the moment, for more detail, please contact me or Adele uh, Simon from uh, Amara International. Uh, thank you and sorry for this long presentation. Thank you very much.